Last week, I started a series on Joseph, Joseph in Genesis, not New Testament Joseph. And my main idea was this, it's that Joseph's story is really just a reflection of God's story. Like God is using Joseph to tell his story. And Joseph is not the point of the story. Uh, The illustration I used uh, was about my son, Bronson. And I said that Bronson isn't great at communicating, which is okay because he's one year old, or he's a little over one, he shouldn't know how to communicate greatly yet. Uh, But to get his attention, to get him to look at things, you can't really just point at stuff or used to not be able to because he wouldn't really pay attention, right? Because he's one and he doesn't know know what that means. But what he does is when he points at things, he sticks his hands out and he goes, what's that? What's that? And he's not saying, what's that? He's just going, what's that? And that's when he wants you to look at something, that's what he does. Or when he wants to see something or touch something, that's what he does. And so when I want him to look at something, what I do now is I stick my hand out like this and I go, what's that? What's that? And he looks at it. And so what I'm doing is I'm speaking his language. I'm figuring out a way to communicate to him. And what I said is God does the same thing with us. He has to figure out how to speak our language. Because just like I am so much smarter than Bronson, God is so much smarter than us. He's, He's so much greater, holier, so much better than we are. Not that you're dumb, just that compared to God you are. All right. And so God is so much greater and smarter and holier than you. He has to figure out how to communicate to us. And he has communicated to us through the word. But one of his uh, main ways of communicating to us in the word is stories. And so through these stories, we see who God is. When we read stories in the Bible, the point is not the characters of the stories necessarily. While they do have a role to play, they are not the main role. The main point of stories in the Bible is to show us who God is, specifically in Genesis. The problem is we often treat these stories in the Bible like it's our yearbook. When you get a yearbook, the first thing you do is when you were in high school, you'd you'd open it up and you'd find the picture of you. And you'd look for the little individual picture of you. And then after that, you'd start going through the collages. And you would look for pictures of you. And then you'd go to the sports or the activities that you did and find the picture of you. And you're trying to find you, you, you all throughout the yearbook. And we often treat the Bible like that. Like we're trying to find us in the Bible and we're trying to find where we are. And we're trying to find us. And while the Bible does talk about humanity and you should look through the Bible and try to, try to find what's applicable to you. First and foremost, the Bible is a story about God, not a story about you. It's God revealing himself to humanity. A lot of people say the Bible is the roadmap to life. And while it may be the, there is direction in the Bible and there are maps in the Bible, Primarily, it's not just a roadmap for you. It's a story where God is revealing himself. And a lot of people say the Bible is a love story. And it's true that there is love in the Bible and God is showing that he loves people. It's not just a love story. It's a story about God. And and I said that God is first for God before he is for us. Not that he doesn't love us and not that he doesn't care about us, but first and foremost, he's about himself and he's about glorifying his name. And he's revealing who he is to us Through different stories, okay? And so that was my main point for the first week. God is revealing who he is. It's God's story through the life of Joseph. We're seeing who God is. This week, what I'm going to say is God is revealing himself, but he's showing us something specific about him. It's that God is always with his people. God is always with his people. I got two chairs down here. I've seen this illustration, and I loved it. Uh, Let's say this is life, and this is who we are. We're sitting here, and every now and then people will come up next to us, and we'll have our family, and we'll have our friends, and, and they'll come up and talk to us. But for the most part, a lot of times, we're, we're by ourselves. Even when we are around people, we're in our heads. The truth is, is that a lot of us think that we're always by ourselves, but God is always right here next to you. Even if you don't feel it, even if you don't understand it, even if it feels like he's not, he's always sitting here right next to you. We often say things like, God, please bring your presence here today. Or God, please show up today. But the truth is, he has showed up, and he is with us, and his presence is always with us, and is always sitting right next to us, even when we don't feel it, and even when we don't see it. And so we're going to see that today through the story of Joseph. If you've got your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter uh, 39 with me. Genesis chapter 39, we'll be starting in verse 1. Just as a quick reminder, what we talked about uh, last week, the actual story aspect of it. Joseph was a really good dude, and his brothers loved him, or his brothers did not love him. His dad loved him very much and showed favoritism towards him. And his brothers got jealous, and because of that jealousy, they threw Joseph into a hole and beat him up, and then they sold him to the Ishmaelites. And so Joseph is on his way with the Ishmaelites to Egypt. They told his father that that they found his robe on the side of the road. They took his robe, dipped it in blood, and said, hey, an animal killed him. So his father thinks he's dead. He's with a bunch of Ishmaelites. So Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. It says, 
When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelites' traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So Joseph gets to Egypt, and he's bought by a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar works for the Pharaoh, so he works in the government system. And so he's now a slave to the government. Verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with, was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of the entire household and everything he owned. From that day, Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property. The Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and his livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibilities over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he did not worry about a thing, except what kind of food to eat. So what we see here is Joseph has been sold into slavery, and he's working for a guy named Potiphar, but God is with Joseph. And as Joseph works for Potiphar, he kind of works his way up, up through the work system, and he becomes in charge of everything in Potiphar's house, which is awesome for Joseph. And through it, we see that God is with Joseph through it all. We see specifically three times in these five verses, two through six, where it says that God is with Joseph. It says the Lord was with Joseph in verse 2, and then at the end of verse, two, or verse 3, the Lord was with Joseph. And then again in verse 5, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for the sake of Joseph. And what we see that God is with Joseph, and God is blessing Joseph. And because of that, Potiphar's house is, is good. He literally has to worry about nothing. He just wakes up and has to decide what to eat, and Joseph does the rest. And so we can look at this and be like, man, Joseph has a pretty good life, you know, and things are going pretty well for him. But what we have to understand is this. Even though God is blessing Joseph, Joseph is going through so much pain right now. He's going through so much hurt and agony. Think about it like this. Let's say, and I'm not saying this to be funny or, or any reason, but I just feel like it's something that will connect if we think of it this way. Let's say that you, are, you have brothers and sisters, and they like kidnap you, and then they sell you, and they sell you into sex slavery. And then that you get shipped to another country, okay? And in that other country, you get out of that, nothing ever happens to you, but you can't escape the slavery that you're in. You're just in slavery to someone else. You can't leave the country, but you have this job, and you work your way up through the job, but you're still in slavery. That would be horrible. That would be miserable. You would be thinking about how your family has betrayed you. You'd be thinking about how they sold you. You'd be thinking how you're stuck stuck away from everybody else in your family that you want to see. You'd be filled with so much pain. And so much hurt. And the same is true with Joseph. While God is blessing him and God is blessing his work and he's working his way up and he's in charge of Potiphar's house, he's still full of pain, right? Like his brothers tried to kill him and then traded him for some money. And he'll never get to see his dad again, he thinks. And he's away from the promised land. He is full of pain and hurt. And so the same is true with us. Even though we have God's presence as Christians and as followers of Jesus, even though God is with us, we still have pain and we still have hurt. Even though we know that God is with us and we believe that and we believe we have the Holy Spirit, there's things that happen that hurt us. There's family members who get on our nerves. There's family members who try to hurt us. There's friends who've betrayed us. There's people at work who drive us nuts. There's bad situations that happen to you, like family members dying and all this stuff going on. And so even though Joseph has God's presence, he's still in pain. And even though we have God's presence, uh, we're still in pain. I think about this too with Joseph. Remember in in, in last time when we read in, in Genesis chapter 37, Joseph had these dreams and in these dreams, his brothers were bowing down to him and God was speaking to Joseph. Why isn't Joseph having visions now? Like, think about that. He thinks about those visions that he had two chapters ago, and he's probably thinking, why am I having visions now? Why is God not communicating to me? And we do the same thing. We say, God, why are you not showing me what I need to do with my life? Why are you not showing me that I need to take this job or that job? Why do I not hear you, and why do I not feel you? Even though we have the word and God speaks to us through the word, sometimes we read it and we get absolutely nothing out of it. But that doesn't mean God's presence is not with us, okay? Even though we don't feel God or see God, he's still with us. Let's take a look here at the end of verse 5, end of verse 6, or end of verse 6. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. 
How should I do such a wicked thing? I would be a, it would be a great sin against God. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her. And he kept out of his way, or kept out of her way as much as possible. So what we see here again is that Joseph is a good dude. We talked about this uh, last week, that Joseph, when, when his dad told him to do something, he did it. He was faithful to his dad, and now he's being faithful to his, his boss, and even more, being faithful to God. This woman is hitting on him. It happens to be his boss's wife and trying to get him to sleep with her. And he's like, no, I'm good. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be faithful to my boss. I'm going to be faithful to, to my God, because that's more important. And so he's a good dude. He's a faithful man. What a lot of people will do at this point is turn this sermon into an idea about sexual purity. That is important, and that is something that should be talked about. But that's not the main point of this chapter. That's not even a, it's just a little small point. It's low-hanging fruit, okay? There is much better text to talk about sexual purity, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and that's not what this text is really about. While it is important that we should flee to sexual temptation, and it's something that should be talked about in church, that's not what God is trying to communicate to us today. And here's why. Let's take a look at verse 11. Uh, as I do that, Ethan, can you bring up my book bag, please? I forgot something in it that I'm going to need eventually. Thank you. Verse 11. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by the cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. Thank you. That's good. When she saw that she was holding his cloak, And he had fled. She called out to her servant. Soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. When he heard heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind. She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. Then she told him her story. The Hebrew slave you've brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside leaving his cloak with me. So what happens is this woman keeps on hitting on Joseph over and over, and he, she finally gets Joseph by himself and, and seizes Joseph and says, hey, you're going to sleep with me or else. And Joseph says no, and he runs away, and his cloak gets ripped off. And then she tells everybody that Joseph tried to, to rape her, and because of that, what we're going to see is he's going to get thrown in, j- in jail. What I learned, or what I think, what would have solved all of Joseph's problems is if he just walked around naked. Every time he gets in trouble, it's because of his shirt, right? Like the first time, they frame his death by taking his shirt off of him and dipping it in blood. This time he gets in trouble because the woman rips off his shirt. If he just walked around naked, he would have never gotten in trouble. It would have solved everything. But what we see here is, uh, is Joseph gets put in jail for this. What's his reward for being sexually pure? What's his reward for for running away from sexual temptation? It's jail. And so that's why this text isn't about sexual temptation. If it is, then the reward would be jail. And that's not good. The Bible doesn't say when you stay sexually pure, you're going to get jail. No, that says the exact opposite. Another thing about this is, is how many men in here are getting hit on by their boss's wife because they're so handsome? That's not a lot of us in here. That's why this text is not about sexual purity, okay? It's not. It's not. It's about much more than that. That's the low-hanging fruit. Here's the more important thing. is that being obedient to God does not mean that you'll get favor with man. When you're obedient to God, some people may not like it. I'm not saying that if people don't like you, uh, I'm not saying that people don't like you because you're a Christian. If a lot of people don't like you, it's probably more because you're a jerk than anything. It's not because you're a Christian, okay? But sometimes when we're faithful to God, people are not going to like it. Sometimes when you're at work and you won't cheat because you want to honor your God, your boss is going to get upset at you. And sometimes your family members who want to sit around and and talk about people and and sin and and do things and then you don't do it, they're going to get upset at you because they think you're being judgmental. And sometimes when your friends want to go out and do some things that you're like, man, I'm not comfortable with because I'm following Jesus, they may think that you're being judgmental. So when you're obedient to God, that doesn't always mean that people are going going to be okay with it. People are going to be okay with it. The problem is we preach the exact opposite thing in a lot of churches. We say, come to God, and your marriage is going to be great. Or come to God, and and you're going to have all this stuff, and you're going to get all these things. This is the idea of the prosperity gospel. If you come to God, then God is going to bless you with money, and God is going to bless you with possessions, and God is going to bless you with everything. And we make God into an ATM. It's like we can press buttons, and when we press buttons, God has to listen to what we say. We do not control God. God is not controlled by man. We cannot do anything to get him to do what we want. God is rogue, and he does what he wants when he wants. 
There's not a list of rules that you follow, and God has to listen to you. One day, I'm watching TV, right? And there's this preacher on TV. He's a big dude. He's a pretty big dude. And he's walking around, and he says, to get God's blessing, all you got to do is stick your hand in the pot. And then he draws this pot in front of him, just like this. He draws this pot. He says, just stick your hand in the pot. He says, you stick your hand in the pot by tithing. So when you stick your hand in the pot, you're tithing, you pull out a blessing from God, and he's going to... Uh, Make it tenfold. He says, when you're faithful to God, you stick your hand in the pot and you pull out a blessing from God and he does what you want. You stick your hand in the pot and God has to listen to you. This idea is that if you do what God says in the Bible, then he has to bless you with monetary possessions or he has to heal your sickness. And that's just not true. God does not work like that. He's not an ATM. The only promise we get when it comes to being obedient to God is that we get God's presence. The blessing that we get from God is his presence. Look at Joseph here, one of the most faithful men in the Bible. I said this last week, there's three people I trust to watch my son because they're the only three people in the Bible who have extensive stories that do nothing wrong. It's Joseph, David, and Jesus. Joseph here, one of the most faithful men in the Bible, the blessing he gets from God is he gets put in jail. Like, that's, that sucks. That's horrible. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. That's horrible, okay? Like, that's bad. That's bad. God blesses us with his presence. Oh, let's continue here. Verse 19. Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. So you see Joseph is put in prison, and while he's in prison, everything is going good for him again. Like God is blessing his work, and God is with him. It's to the point to where the warden has nothing to worry about, and the warden has no problems. He just has to wake up and just kind of go to work, and Joseph kind of takes care of everything. And we can start thinking again, well, this is awesome. Like, God is blessing Joseph, and, and, and Joseph is getting a great reward. But remember this. He's still in prison, right? Like, he's still in prison, and prison is horrible. I've been to prison a couple times. Uh, not as an inmate, as, as a visitor. And I don't know if you guys have ever been to prison before. Uh, some of you as inmates and some of you as visitors. But it's horrible, okay? It's, it's horrible. I walk in there and I just see people and they're hurting, man. And I see that they're sitting around a table talking to their family and have to raise their hand to go to the bathroom. They're only going to get two to four hours with their family for the week. I see people when they talk through glass, like they have to talk through glass to their family, they get lonely. And it's horrible. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be in there. I'm not saying that they didn't deserve what their punishment that they've gotten. I'm just saying it's horrible. And Joseph is going through that same thing. Uh, we have a member or someone who comes to our church named Danny Raup. Some of you may know him. Uh, he wrote us a letter. He is in prison right now. And uh, he was, he's been coming to church, and then he got put in prison for past things, and so he's in prison right now. And he wrote us a letter. He wanted me to show it to you guys. Here's his envelope. He likes to do drawings. But let me just read a part of it uh, so it will help with the sermon. Uh, this letter will be out on the table over there if any of you want to read the full thing or look at it. But here's what he says. And please bear with me as I read this. Uh, he has really bad handwriting, so it's kind of hard to read. So... He says, Dear Lodge Church of God family, good morning. I just wanted to write a short note and let you all know you're in my thoughts and prayers daily. Sunday mornings in here are the hardest because I miss Sunday morning fellowship service so much. I would like to say you are my friend, you are friends of mine, but you are much more than that. You all are my family in Christ. I miss you very much. And then he drew a smiley face with a tongue sticking out. He says, well, I've been gone now, on now for, six, for nine months, and it seems like nine years. When they uh, sent me to prison this time, I felt more in the world than I ever have before. More people I loved and cared about than ever before. With that being said, it has made this time all the harder. They took a lot from me, but they couldn't take on one thing from me. And that is the love of Jesus from my life and my heart. With God, we are never alone. You can read the rest of this if you want. I'll leave it out on the table. But here's where I'm going with this. Like, Danny is in prison right now, and it's horrible for him. Even though he's in Camp Cupcake, as he would say, and it's the easiest prison he's ever been in, he's still full of pain because he's lonely and he's hurt. He's still full of pain because he doesn't get to see people that he usually gets to see every day. And he's isolated and by himself. He doesn't get to be around his family and his friends. Same thing is going on with Joseph here. 
Like while Joseph is being blessed by God in prison, he's still in prison and he's still by himself. And he's still full of pain that he doesn't get to see his dad. And even though his brothers turned on him, that he doesn't get the relationship of his brothers. And he's mulling over things and thinking about how his life is. And he's going to be in there for over a decade. But as Danny said, even though he was taken to prison, he can't get the love of Jesus taken from him. And the same is true here, same is true with Joseph. Even though Joseph is in prison, God's presence is still with him. Uh, then here real quick, I'm going to jump to chapter 41, just read one part towards the end of chapter 41, or chapter 40, sorry. What's happening is Joseph is in prison, and he's been in there for a while, he ends up being in there for over a decade, and two people get thrown in, in the prison. One of them is a baker uh, for, the, for the pharaoh, and the other one is a cupbearer for the pharaoh. They both have dreams, and Joseph is able to interpret these dreams by the power of God, and, and the, the dream of the cupbearer uh, Joseph says, hey, your dream means that in three days, you're going to get set free from here. The Pharaoh is going to come down and set you free, and you're going to work for the Pharaoh again. But then the baker's dream, he interprets, and he says, your dream means that in three days, the Pharaoh is going to come down here. He's going to take you and impale you in front of all his people. And so the three days comes, and this is what we're going to read, chapter 40, verse 20. Pharaoh's birthday came three days later, and he prepared a banquet for all his officials and staff. He summoned the chief cupbearer and chief baker to join the other's officials. He then restored the chief cupbearer to his former position so he could again hand Pharaoh his cup. But Pharaoh impaled the chef baker, just as Joseph had predicted when he interpreted his dream. Pharaoh's chef cupbearer, however, or chief cupbearer, sorry, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. So what happens is exactly what Joseph said would happen happens, and the cupbearer gets put by the Pharaoh, and the baker gets killed and impaled. But the cupbearer doesn't remember Joseph. Even though he says, hey, I will tell the Pharaoh about you and I'll get you out of this prison, he doesn't. He just forgets about Joseph. And Joseph is stuck in prison for over a decade. And so just think about that. It says God's presence is with Joseph, but he never catches any breaks. It says God is with Joseph, but he has all this pain and stuff going on. Here's a big takeaway that I want you to take today. Your circumstance does not dictate God's presence for you. Your current circumstance does not mean that God is not with you, okay? I know that there's stuff going on. I know there's pain, and I know there's hurt. But God is just as much with you in the pain as he is on your best day. God is just as much with you on your most best day ever as he is on your most worst day ever. God's presence does not leave you as a follower of Jesus. This is hard to hear and even harder to believe, okay? This is a hard thing to believe. If you're like me when everything is going good, life is good. Like, life is good, and everything's lining up. You're like, man, I feel good, and then you feel God's presence. But when life is bad, if you're like me, then you, everything's going bad, and you don't feel God's presence because of all this bad stuff happening to you. The truth is God is with you in both situations. Let me give you an illustration here. Uh, about two months ago, I went on a trip to Chicago with Chastity. It's like a little three-day mini vacation. Uh, we went and stayed at a cheap hotel and went to an arcade and Navy Pier, a few things like that. Uh, real, real small trip. And as we were going on that trip, a bunch of things went bad. It was like just thing after thing after thing. Uh, we got lost in Chicago, trying to figure out where to go, getting stuck in Chicago traffic. We weren't able to make it to supper on time before the movie. Uh, we got stuck at this mall for too long. So all these things were going wrong. And so what happened is I ended up getting mad at Chastity, even though it wasn't her fault. And I started arguing with her. And she was trying to defend herself, which she should. But I just was arguing with her because I was angry. And I almost ruined the whole trip because I was angry. And in that moment, I didn't feel God's presence. In those moments, I didn't think about God. I wasn't like dwelling on Jesus. I just had totally forgotten about him. And I wasn't thinking that God was with me through it. Now this week, something happened as well that could have totally ruined my week. Actually, it was the end of last week, in through this week. Go to start my Yaris. It's a pretty new car. got 70,000 miles on it, and it won't start. And so we take it. I get it jumped. Me and my dad take it up to AutoZone, and they tell me, well, the alternator's bad. I'm like, oh, man, that stinks. So we take it home, try to take apart the car to get the alternator out. We spend about two hours doing that. And as we're doing that, there's a bolt on one part of the car that we can't get done because it's stripped. So we have no idea how to get it off. So then we have to try to put it back together to take it to a mechanic. That takes another two hours. So we spent four hours working on it. Alternator's not fixed. So I take it to the mechanic the next day. They give me a nice $350 bill. That took them less than 20 minutes to change, which is okay. It's part of being a mechanic. They, they can do that. And so they fix it, which is great. I take it home, and the next morning I go to start it, and it doesn't start again. 
And so I take it up to AutoZone, and they're like, oh, the alternator ended up killing your battery, so now you need to buy a $100 battery. I'm like, okay. So they put in the battery for me, and, uh, and, it gets, and it's working. And so I have it for a couple days, and then I'm actually driving it here uh, for something, and the whole engine is shaking. Like, everything's shaking. The alternator's shaking. The engine's shaking. The radiator's shaking. Everything is shaking. I was just like, what else could go wrong with this car? I ended up taking it back to the mechanic, and they fixed it, thankfully. And that was it. That could have ruined my week. That could have ruined my, my, my each day and each week. But the thing is, is that I realized that God is with me in those moments. Even when things are going wrong, even when things are going bad, God is still with me. The difference between two months ago on my vacation and this past week is I remembered God's presence. So when things are going wrong and when things are hurting, when things are going bad and sickness and death and whatever's going on, if you remember God's presence, you remember that he's there with you. That'll help you through it. It's not that it will take away the pain, but it'll help you respond to the pain in a better way. Instead of lashing out on people in front of you, it'll help you respond by loving the people in front of you. One last story here. This one's about Bronson. Uh, I was thinking, maybe I'd tell too many stories about Bronson, but then I realized that you guys like Bronson more than you like me. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I know this to be true because on Facebook, I'll post a picture of me and Chastity, or I'll post a picture of football, get like maybe 20 likes and like a couple comments. Post a picture of Bronson, I get like 150 likes and 35 comments about how adorable he is. And most of them are from you guys, and that's okay. I just know you like him more than me, and I'm fine with that. I, I like him more than me too. Uh, but so... I, like some things like football I won't tell too many stories about because I don't want to like overwhelm people with it. But Bronson, I don't have a problem with it. So one day, or we used to, we still do, we walk with Bronson quite a bit and we walk around, we have a bike path in the back. But when he was younger, what would happen is we would walk with him and as we're walking, me and Chastity are talking, but then we would get quiet. And once we got quiet for a minute or two, he would start yelling. And what I'd do is I'd walk to the front of, the, of him and he would see me. And then I'd walk back, and me and Chastity would start talking again. He would calm down, and we'd be walking, walking. Eventually, we'd get quiet, and then he would start crying again. And I'd have to go to the front to show him that I'm there. He can't see us from the back of the stroller. So I go up there. I'm like, hey, I'm here, buddy. He's like, oh, okay, and he quits crying. And so we'd do this constantly as we're walking. If we got quiet for a minute or two, he would just start yelling. All he wanted to know is that we were there with him, that we were walking with him, and we were by him. We do the same thing when it comes to God. A lot of times we freak out because we don't understand God is with us. We don't see him. We don't hear him. We don't, we don't know that he's there, yet he still is. But because we don't know that he's there, we freak out and we get frustrated and we start to lash out on people around us and we start to doubt ourselves and we start to get anxiety. The truth is God is with you no matter where you're at. Whether it's bad situations going on or sin that you have in your life, God is still right there next to you walking with you. And that's the point of the text. Not that we should flee sexual temptation and not that we should work hard at work, both things that are true. But the point of this text is that God is with you no matter where you're walking and what you're going through. What's even better for us is that we have something even better than Joseph. We have the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I'm going to leave, and when I leave, I'm going to give you something greater than me. It's not that the Holy Spirit is greater than Jesus. It's that Jesus can only be in a certain place at a certain time, but the Holy Spirit can be with all of his believers. And so we all have the Holy Spirit with us. When you trust and give your life to Jesus, when you believe that he died for your sins and rose from the grave, then you have that Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you and with you. And that's, that's so much greater than what Joseph had. So we literally have God's presence inside of us, and that's amazing. That's amazing. So just want to encourage you with that. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, whether it's good or bad, God is with you and walking with you. Uh, let me pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, even when we don't feel it and even when we don't see it. Even if we're like Joseph and we're put in unfair situations because of people around us and we have family members who are hurting us and we have people who are trying to get us in trouble, Lord, we know that you're walking with us and we thank you for that. And even when things are going good and everything seems great and we've done all these things and we've earned all these rewards, Lord, we know that it all comes from you and you're still with us through that too. Uh, please help us understand that. And so when we're around people, when we're around people and we're frustrated, we don't have to lash out on them. We don't have to yell at them or scream at them. We don't have to blame them for our problems. Uh, because we know that you are with us and that you love us. We thank you for Jesus, for your son, who gives us the Holy Spirit, that through him we have salvation and we have hope and we have love and we have grace. We thank you for that. Uh, yeah, as we go out this week, just help us remember that you are with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, have a great week, guys.